Welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm your host for this show. I'm a commercial banker by background. I'm joined by my co-host, James Chan, who's owner of Asia Marketing Company. Thank James you. is a long-time consult consultant for marketing to Asia, <laughs> principally, I believe, China. Principally China, but it doesn't have to be just China, right. you know, okay. kind of surrounding regions. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, China's certainly been um, a lot in the news uh, recently, not just the last uh, couple <laughs> of weeks of near this show, but for, for months. It's a huge, huge economy. I know. It's a growing economy. The U.S. does an awful lot of business with China, and there's been a lot of talk about how to, how to do that business, and there's been a lot of talk about, for example, the use of tariffs. And we'll be talking about some tariffs uh, later. I thought maybe we would sort of um, talk to the <coughs> audience a little bit about this whole concept of tariffs. What are they? Uh, how they've been used in the past? What's the purpose of them? So from your business background, James, and you've been a, you're a PhD, you're a geography uh, a doctorate. Um, you've studied uh, business and trade for, for years and years. How would you explain tariffs and the use of tariffs in, in general, in a general way? <coughs> well, the, uh, the the simplest way to explain it is, you know, if you want to protect uh, your own business or industry uh, uh, against imports, mm -hmm. what you tell the uh, exporter from another country is to say, all right, whatever you uh, try to bring into my country, I'm going to hit a 50% increase. For uh, example, some years ago, <coughs> uh, the steel industry right. was complaining about right. imported steel. Right hurting their business right. at all. So there's, there's a you had, uh, U.S. Steel Company had huge, huge, Bethlehem sure. Steel, huge sure. steel companies yeah. Yeah. that complained about right. other companies selling steel to the U.S. cheaply. So the thought was, well, maybe the U.S. should put a tariff on those imported goods, that imported steel, kind of a, a tax. So if U.S. Steel was selling it for $100 a ton and some other country was sending it into this country at $60 a ton, we'd put a $50 tariff on that ton and make it more expensive. Yeah, theoretically, it should work that way. And as a matter of fact, if you remember in the 1970s, mm -hmm. when Japan was like Japan Inc., remember the, sure. the battle everything. cry, sure. Japan yeah. Inc.? You know, and people, lots of people agree, Japan was dumping its products mm -hmm. and we were importing so much Japanese products, mm -hmm. we had a big trade deficit and it was right. very, very true. And there were lawsuits and some of the suits mm -hmm. we even won, mm -hmm. you know, claiming that, not claiming, proving mm -hmm. that the Japanese actually did dump their products. So we had tariffs, mm -hmm. guess what? Nothing happened. The steel industry is still mm -hmm. petering out. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, when you say dumpy, what, what, what is, how does that word dump mean? Dumping in, in this, meaning this, uh, if I can, if I, if, if theoretically, if we, if we, if it costs us ten dollars to make a a product, and me, who is going to import and break into your country, you are a separate country, I you're will get Japan. the help. You're I Japan. Will. You're Japan. Yeah, I'm so Japan. You're going to sell a refrigerator to the U.S. Right, I'm going to sell a refrigerator to you, Paul. You're the U.S. Mm -hmm. And normally, in theory, it costs us $10. Mm -hmm. But me, with my government and with my own business network, mm -hmm. we try to get resources so that I can sell it at $6. For example, the, the Japanese government may actually give you a subsidy right. of, right. of right. some amount of money yeah. to, so that you can then right. absorb, take that subsidy. So, well, between the subsidy and what I'm going to get selling to the U.S., I'm ahead of the game, but right. I have the subsidy, right. I sell it at a loss, right. and I can't do that. Yeah. Right. We can go on and on and on for 30 years. We're not going to do this, but in order to satisfy you and the audience, mm -hmm. basically tariffs, basically over the past 30 some years, have never worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it but, happened. But tariffs have been going on for these hundreds of years, on and off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people have used it all over, and but there's one, one point, or you may call this a statistic that the viewers should really know. America never had any trade deficit until 1976. Hmm. In other words, for decades before 1976, we as a country never incur much of a deficit hmm. at all. Because we were such a huge economy and making so much stuff, we were selling all our stuff. Yeah, we were making a lot of stuff. Remember, Trenton makes the world takes. Yes. Trenton makes the world takes. On the bridge there, Yeah, sure. we were the exporter. Yeah. 
That's right. Well, That's so, great manufacturing so maybe people country. should think about why. What yeah. happened yeah. since 1976? Other countries started making, ma ma manufacturing. Yeah, and we are taking. And, and they had lower costs. Right. So, uh, for example, a Walmart could import uh, widgets, fill up their stores with things made outside the U.S. Right. and sell them a lot less ex uh, expensively to us, the U.S. consumer, which we liked. The which consumers made, like Walmart a until huge store. Uh, the consumers like until they no longer can buy their products cheaply or they can't buy them at all. Mm -hmm. So we or can go on forever. Or they Paul. think they think that because somebody overseas is making the product, right? Jobs in the U.S. Right. The, are less. The, the gripe now, the gripe, and I can understand the gripe because I am not an importer. I, I'm, I'm, I am not my role in my daily life over the past 35 years is to help American companies export to mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. To China? To China. Yeah. I am helping company grab money mm -hmm. from the Chinese yeah. pockets. It already tells you what is my philosophy. Yeah, sure. I am very much anti-importing, mm -hmm. to, to be very yes. frank and blunt right. and very politically mm -hmm. incorrect. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, importing is legal. Sure, sure. See? But let's just, before we, we have to, we go to our guest. Our right. guest is very mm -hmm. interesting. Right. Um, so what happens when a country institutes tariffs? Mm -hmm. And why don't they work? Why don't they go on for a long period of time? Uh, well, because the first, other of all, first of all, if we, America, decides to hit any country with an increase in tariff, mm -hmm. then they will retaliate. And number two, uh, after they retaliate, then the businesses themselves are not going to lose money because if they don't import from China, they can import from Germany, they mm. can import from India, they can import from Philippines. Mm. So the businesses are not hurting. Sure. It's only the consumers. Why? Because if businesses decided to uh, lay off people because of a bad economy, then you know we're talking about in the end, it's the consumers getting hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, businesses can always raise the price. So how can they lose? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so the tariffs don't don't typically work in the long run. Free trade, which means without tariffs, is the way the, the world economy has generally been going the last. Enough people have believed that free trade is still a better idea. Yeah. It's not perfect. Right. There are still many problems that people have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I think we have, uh, I mean, we can continue to a lot for a long, long time. Yeah. Let's focus on our guest. Yeah. Well, just one last example in terms okay. of what companies can do when they, if they, one source is, is a problem, they go to another source. I once had a customer as a, as a commercial banker mm. that um, imported um, a certain type of, uh, I'll say, large office product. Right. And typically, they would order order from me. It could be China or India or, or the U.S. or uh, other European countries or whatever, even South Africa. Well, there was a time some not too long ago that the apartheid was a big issue, and the many U.S. Uh, companies said, "Well, we're not going to allow, uh, we're not going to you know purchase from apartheid type countries." Got it. So this particular company said, looked around, and they found a supplier in Uruguay. Oh sure, of yeah, course. I mean, so Uruguay, that's that's not a big. Um, who, you know, where's the last time you bought something that said made in Uruguay? Well, lots of things are made in Uruguay. Business, it's, a, it's a big world out there. Businesses have lots of alternatives. And they made, and it was a great relationship. Alternative. Great product. People great have price. alternatives. Company did very well. So, it's we'll a big world more. out there. We'll yeah. talk more about this. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, we are fortunate to have a uh, very interesting uh, guest. Uh, we will now introduce our special guest for this show is Denise Dunkley. Denise. Nice Welcome to the show. Denise is CMO, which I believe is Chief Marketing Officer mm -hmm. for Weidenhammer? Weidenhammer. Weidenhammer. Yes. Uh, which is a marketing company. No, it's a technology company. Technology company. Yes. Better, okay. So. Well, why am I, why, how did I get that wrong? How I do marketing for the technology company. Okay. <laughs> so what, what does Weidenhammer do and what do you do for Weidenhammer? So Widenhammer, Widenhammer sorry. If for their elevator pitch is basically they help customers and clients mm -hmm. master the digital economy. And it sounds like a big statement, but it basically can be broken down into three areas of helping businesses address customer experiences, mm -hmm. operational efficiency, and workforce effectiveness. Okay. And yes. so give us an example of a customer experience that 
uh, Weidenhammer uh, works on. So for example, retailers were the first industry that understood that in order to gain market share and more importantly keep market share, that they had to have this very cohesive customer experience. So where it used to be bricks and mortar and someone would go into a building, mm -hmm. you're dealing with what does the building atmosphere look like? What does your customer service look mm -hmm. like? How fast can you get through the checkout line? All of these things. Mm -hmm. So when a lot of the business went online, for a while there was a little bit of what do we do? And retailers were the first to say, wow, we need to make our online experience just as good as our bricks and mortar mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot about putting a website together that a customer likes the experience that they have. It, the website's intuitive, it's colorful, yep. it's easy to navigate, you know, it's easy to make orders, it's easy to make returns. Mm -hmm. You know, if they do have to call a call center, sure. is that person easy to get a hold of? And so replicating the customer experience across the entire value chain is extremely important. Yeah. Okay. Before I forget, why did you join White & Hammer? Because I, I read your bio okay. you know, before I came. I did my homework. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you were your own business owner. I you, was. You were, you were a business owner. S you were consulting, of course, in marketing. Yes. So what made the switch? So previous to having my own consulting business, mm -hmm. I had very senior executive roles in companies such as KPMG, Answer Think, Return on Intelligence. And that was always where I had a lot of passion. Okay. And I started my own business for mm -hmm. different reasons, mm -hmm. but was always looking for the right opportunity and the right company mm -hmm. that I wanted to go back into that environment. Okay. Okay. And Widenhammer offers all of those things. You know, they've, they've been in business 40 years. Mm -hmm which is amazing. They, their culture of yes we can is mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. um, everyone understands that culture and they have the expertise in-house to accurately and properly deliver the services that they say they're going to deliver. So it was a win-win-win for me when they mm -hmm. were looking for a chief marketing officer. Mm -hmm. very was, good. was there a digital economy 30, 35 years ago? When White and Hammer was young? That's a good question. It, that is a really good question. They didn't call it a digital economy that far back. Uh. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of perceptions of the word because some people say everything's digital, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Basic, basically it comes down to how do you drive revenue. So mm, yeah. it's really, you can say digital transformation, you can say digital economy, but basically it's like how do I drive bottom line results? And what are the areas that affect that? And it's your customer experience, your operational efficiency, and your workforce effectiveness. Something you said earlier that to me is very is fascinating and intriguing too, which is if I got your meaning correctly, which is how do you digital digitally make the shopper have as pleasant an experience? shopping online versus shopping physically, yes. like walking into like yes. the Wanamaker Tou department store. It, yes. How it. do you That's do right. that? Can you give one very specific example that, I mean, for what you do particularly, that, that you can get customer to feel happy, uh, pleasurable? The, one of the most important things about when you buy online mm -hmm. is the intuitiveness of shopping on the site and the organization of the material on the site okay. and promoting the brand of the company. Mm -hmm. So the brand of the company is the look, it's the feel, it's how it's written, do I enjoy scrolling through the pages. The more someone clicks on a website, the higher the chance that they're going to make a purchase. So you want to build websites that are highly interactive. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Makes sense. So how do you define today's digital econ economy? Today's digital economy is basically in the fact that we all shop online for everything now. Not just it's not just retail. You know. It's your bank. I mean, <laughs> banking's right. Yeah. You, wanna uh, yeah. He's you the want to? We want to direct customers to yeah. uh, to the bank because we don't have to uh, pay as many as employees. Exactly. If people are doing business digitally. And there's no more banker hours, right? Uh. There's it's now 24 by 7, right? 
So you want to have that experience, especially if you're not talking to a customer service rep at that time. Mm -hmm. can, I have, can I have a positive experience from the website? Can I get everything done? Is all of the information put in where I can mm -hmm. get to it quickly and effectively and you know make my transfers, make my deposits, check my mm -hmm. checking account, all of those things. And some banks do it well and some banks do not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, another question I have right now is with all the digital things happening and the hacking and oh. the lack of safety, how do we make it safer or is there a way at all? Absolutely. So cybersecurity is huge and it's just going to get larger and larger and larger. You know, when companies like Equifax get hacked, yeah. you know <laughs> it's a big deal, right? <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> so, um, what we do as part of when we go to a client that needs cybersecurity support, right. mm -hmm. we teach them that really their front line is their human firewall. So it's their employees. Oh. And so oh. most people think of it as being a system. Correct. Right. The computer thing, uh -huh. not a human thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it is the human thing. Oh. That is the first level because usually a hacker will send an email. And so we have we have the ability to train employees and have them recognize what is a phishing email. Mm -hmm. what, why is an email oh. potentially oh. sent from a bad source? Let me make sure I understand, just to mm -hmm. double confirm, because this is important to me. So you're saying that employees need, train, need to be trained to think smarter, more critically more carefully, more prudently against an intruder. Yes. It's the employee who has yes. to know. It's your first line of defense because that's that's the easiest way for a hacker to attack a company. But I thought it was the employee. system. I thought it was the a wiser, a smarter computer <laughs> system coming into, yeah. getting into your computer system. That's a way, but that is the safest way to safeguard your company is building a human firewall and oh. training your employees on what to recognize. I've learned something new. Okay, I guys. never thought about it uh, yeah. until yeah. now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about training your employees, what, what kind of employees does um, White & Hammer bring in? I mean, is it, they're all young, smart engineers or what? Actually, that was one of the things that was fascinating for me. Mm -hmm. um, some of the people at Widenhammer have been there for 40 years. So some of their, they have mm -hmm. original employees. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was very attractive to me mm -hmm. because when you start a company and people stay, there's a reason, right? right? Um, but no, they've evolved the company over time mm -hmm. to bring in new people because the digital economy has evolved over 40 years. So we've had to bring in new talent, new resources, new ways of looking at things mm -hmm. in order to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. How many employees does White & Hammer have? Approximately 150. Wow, that's that good. sounds like a good, big, good, substantial good. company. So what's your biggest challenge now yeah. as a company? Or you as a marketing officer, what, that's what's the first? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I want to do for White & Hammer yeah is really express their brand and mm -hmm. why people should want to experience the Widen Hammer experience. And it's relevant across the board, but a lot of people don't understand what is mastering the digital economy, mm -hmm. what does that involve, and if you had you know, 20 organi organizations to pick from, why would you pick Widen right, Hammer? Right, mm -hmm. right. So my right. challenge is to make sure right. that that's crystal clear. Differentiation. Differentiation. Mm -hmm. So you have to say there is the White and Hammer system yeah. strategy. Right. Well, I mean, it's a combination of things. Mm -hmm. Basically, people buy on trust. <laughs> uh, true. Right. So if they trust you, they will buy from you. So it's combining this idea of we've been here 40 years, you can trust us, we have the in house expertise. Yeah. to provide you the yeah. services, and yeah. we believe in long term relationships. Trust is so simple and yet so complicated yeah, and yeah. almost not speakable because it's, it's, it's a feeling. And it really doesn't come, uh, yeah, well, it I guess no, sometimes no. I was going to say it doesn't come uh, overnight. No. But when you meet somebody, I mean, they say in the first 30 seconds you make You, you make a judgment. Make, uh, there's a, a judgment. Yes, uh, there are totally made. agree. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, is, it is interesting. So, so if a company wants to uh, you know, get involved in the digital economy in, in a bigger way, where do they start? 
So you pull in a consultant or a strategist and they take a look at, you know, what are your operations, what are your biggest challenges, mm -hmm. where do you need to improve, mm -hmm. what are your biggest opportunities for improvement, how do you run your business, and then they go through a, uh, a system basically where they identify what your highest priorities would be. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an example? You don't have to you know, name the company, but maybe a, an industry or something like that, and the size of the company was a $100 million company or a $10 million company, and maybe Certainly. You know, so widgets. Um, so basically, e-commerce, specifically for retails, is a huge deal. So if a retailer does not have an effective shopping cart, and they can't make the transactions simple, they can't do the returns, they can't manage tax, they can't do all of these things, that's a critical area for a retailer to have to improve mm -hmm. for the digital economy. I've certainly experienced uh, across the board with huge companies. Mm -hmm. some, some are excellent at it, some it's like, oh, punish me. Right. Some, it's unbelievable. <laughs> so for example, where more stores are trying to say, well, order, order online, free delivery to our local store and pick it up. And I go there and I have a bad experience. I can't find out where to pick it up. I go to the counter, nobody's there. They give me a hard time, they, they disappear. Right, that's your entire customer experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's what businesses have to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. It's not just a website, yeah. it's who are they talking to on the phone, what is their experience for a purchase, for a return, all of those things. I have an odd question about marketing in a digital economy, which is related to how you enhance customer experience. Now, has there been a theory or method concocted by a, a, a smart company that makes a, an online consumer actually learn something? In other words, it's almost like reading Charles Dickens as you buy mm -hmm. online. Like, because sometimes shopping is a discovering, discovery process. So if I shop and suddenly I feel I've learned something new, isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. So there are, I mean, it depends how you use your website. So if you go shopping for something, right, yeah. and you want to learn something, right. there are websites that say, oh, here's information about this perfume, here's how it was made, yep. here's how the ingredients right. are put yeah. together, all of yeah, those right. things. So again, that goes to the customer experience. How right. far do you want to right. Right. reach out yeah. beyond the actual purchase itself? Right, yeah, yeah. I think it would be fun if, if, if more of that thing can happen, so. Sure, sure. Well, that's fascinating. Um, so I think we are definitely in a digital economy to say that they're challenging. It's good to know that there's some real professionals out there that, um, our, um, our, our viewers uh, can uh, can get help up. Right. I so, so, so some concern about the hacking, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. So there are yes. solutions <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah, good. So if somebody <laughs> did want to uh, contact you and or Weidenheimer, how would they do that? Is there a website? It's www.hammer.net. Oh, hammer. hammer. We that's shortened easy. it because yeah. people had trouble. Oh, hammer, just like the hammer. Yeah. Oh, that's easy. Yep. Oh, hammer.net. Yeah, that's yeah. clever. That's. <laughs> That's good. That's smart. <laughs> Thank you very much, Denise. Are you welcome? Yeah. <laughs> James, we do have a, a question from one of our viewers. Okay. Sam Kelly of Marion asks, how will the trade war affect China and the U.S.? Oh, gee. <laughs> oh, first of all, these things are happening daily, meaning we hear new things every mm -hmm. day. I've thought about it uh, because th this is a, a topic dear and near to my heart. Mm -hmm. I think that I don't believe that tariff is the right tool. It's not the right medication. I mean, the trade deficit is bad. Well, we're having a tr trade war. That was a question about trade war. Oh, trade war is even worse. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, in a trade war, uh, both the exporting country and the importing country will do much less business. Hmm. Yeah, and so the economy goes down, people get laid off, mm -hmm. and the stock market, you know how fidgety stockholders are? Sure. And then if the stock market goes into free gyrations, going up and down and mostly mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. people who are 60 plus, 65 mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. who need the money thinking, oh yeah, I have a million, when in fact suddenly my million has dwindled to 650,000. That's very scary. Yeah, yeah. And those people are going to get hurt. That's really, I, I hope we never have to do that. Okay. So um, you're concerned? 
I'm concerned. Oh yeah, I'm concerned. Yeah. But uh, I, I also to tell you something that it's only a prediction, and I never believe that prediction mm -hmm. is a good thing to do. But uh, you know, people like predictions. <laughs> okay. you know, I'm, I'm not the blind Tiresias. You know, the soothsayer. Okay, so you're in, suggesting uh, that the Iliad and Odyssey. So I cannot tell. I cannot foretell the truth. I think that the Chinese, after a long protracted periods of Pitching and moaning mm -hmm. and negotiating probably will make some concessions, but those concessions in the end still don't mean much. Okay. In other words, we will still have a trade deficit. Mm -hmm. America has to have a structural reconfiguration mm -hmm. in order to get rid of the deficit. Right, structural reconfiguration. Yeah. Just in other words, you have to rearrange your uh, your arms and your legs, and so you have a, you will have a new shape of as a human being, mm -hmm. metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking. Well, we've had a number of revolutions over the last hundred years. We had oh an yeah. industrial revolution. Yeah. Uh, the last uh, yeah. forty years, yeah. we're just talking yeah. about the Maybe di we digital revolution. Suddenly, we have two more heads, so we can think <laughs> more, <laughs> have companionship. Well, if we get to Mars, maybe we'll find somebody that can help us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's <laughs> hope so. But no, I I don't like uh, a trade war, and I hope it okay. never happens. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, that uh, kind of wraps up our show uh, for, for uh, th this time, and I uh, want to say that our next guest will be uh, Dan Capola. And he's going to be a very interesting guest for us and all. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, I just want to make sure that our viewers remember that yeah. on this no show, trade war. <laughs> on this show, your money matters. Uh, yeah.